Welcome to Dirt Man Talking. Tonight's story is from the incredible mind of Charlie Charlemagne from over on Reddit, No Sleep. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And title. 1969 Between the Trees. Part 1. Let's get straight into that. Taken from my grandfather's notebooks, dated winter 1969, thought there'd be a good place to start before I told you all the rest of the story. My family's from Washington State, and he spent pretty much his whole life in the same town up there as a logger. The Journal of Roger Anderson, born 1949, died 2009. November 18th, 1969. Well, logging going well as always. Hands a bit sore. Nasty splinters. Mary helped me pull out some of them, but I should really get some thick gloves. Can't believe how tired I still get doing this. Well, I guess my high school days are already behind me. Only twenty, but you should see some of these older boys who take axes to these trees. I put men like me to shame. I went for a drink with them tonight. Took the truck back home, but took the long route around the forest. You know why. November 21st, 1969. Well, Mary says she's going out of town. Thinks something might be wrong. You can always tell when a woman's hiding something from you. I guess. Or maybe she doesn't like how soft her man is getting. Her jaw dropped if she knew. I even wrote this. Surprised I'm doing more than swinging axes. This is Washington, not New York. So none of this will ever hit a publisher's desk. Unless something of interest starts happening up here. Well, it's a cold night tonight. Stars are all out. Might go out and watch them. November 30th, 1969. <sighs> long week. A long, shitty, complicated week. I don't know where to start. Or even if I want to. In the middle of the workday on Wednesday, we found Jack with his face down in the water, floating downriver in between the timber. You know how this works. Well, obviously. We cut the trees and float them down the river to the sawmill to cut them up into something usable. Nothing out of the ordinary. We assumed Jack had fallen, hit his head on the wood and passed out in the water. Poor bastard couldn't do anything but drown at that point. We guessed. A big old bruise on his forehead. We poured him out of the water and he was as blue as a lapis. Blood running down his face. His jacket was soaked through and his boots had taken on so much water that we weren't sure. We were strong enough to drag him out. And we gave it all we got and pulled the poor fucker out of the water. Checked to see if he was still breathing. Nothing. He was dead by the time we dragged him out onto the bank. Well, that water was so damn cold. We nearly froze ourselves trying to pull him out. And get this. On the far bank, uh, this guy. I've never seen him in my life. He's just watching us. Not moving. Not moving a damn inch. Just... Watching. Strangest thing I'd saw for years. Well, we lost sight of him when we were checking Jack for life. Looked back and the man was gone. Some people, it just ain't right. Staring at us and this poor dead fellow like he was bird watching. Hard though. Lived here all my life and I did not recognize him. Well, service is tomorrow morning. We'll pour a drink out on the ground for Jack that night. Couldn't bring myself to write this before now. Thoughts to Janice, his girl. I hope she makes it out okay. December. Ineligible. Either second or third. 1969. My Mary's pregnant. Went out of town to a fancy clinic just to make sure. I'm going to be a father. How the hell am I supposed to do that? I still make my living shifting wood for pennies an hour. And I drive a beat up old Chevrolet. For Christ's sake. Who the hell is going to want to call me, Dad? Well, I think Michael for a boy or Charlotte for a girl. Let's we'll see what Mary thinks. December 4th, 
1969. Finally, something to write about. Saw an old fella, Frank, down at the bar last night. We just started talking and talking. Only conversation I can remember in my life that I almost got too scared to finish. And Frank's been at the fire department for God knows how long. So he's seen some peculiar things over the years. But, oh Christ, if this wasn't bizarre, I don't know what is. And I got talking about Jack. And the whole town's still buzzing with the news. It's a small town. Everyone knows everyone and all that. He wanted to know what it was like pulling him out of the water. I guess everyone got morbid and curious about these sort of things. And I filled him in on the details. He just shook his head. Shit. Goddamn luck, Frank said when Jack came up in conversation. Ah, cheers to that. We clinked our glasses and sipped in silence, letting the quiet hang there for Jack. Then I opened my mouth. I wish now that I hadn't. I wish I could find that odd bastard, slap some sense into him. Serves him right for just watching us like that, not helping us on nothing. And Frank turned confused. Who you on about? Ah, just some useless fucker who was watching the whole thing from the woods. Didn't lift a fucking finger to help us or nothing. Never seen the bastard before. Ain't right, just watching like that. And Frank froze. Didn't move a muscle. He looked at me like I was Jack's ghost. Uh, which side of the river? And there was a dead seriousness about him, and so I didn't mince my words. Side of the river beneath the hills. Why? You know him? And Frank took a deep gulp, polishing off his drink before waving Dale, the bartender, back over. He asked him to pour us two more. Drink up, Roger, and get comfy. I have a story for you. You don't have to say nothing. Just listen. Don't even tell me what you think. But I think I've seen that old boy from the woods before, and I don't think he's the type of man you want to be seeing. Roger, remember that fire the summer before last? Kids up there the old water tower started smoking. Nearly burnt the whole forest down. Of course. I could see the smoke for miles. Whole state probably smelt the burning. Hell, I reckon they saw it in Portland, Frank. Fucking right they did. So, I was one of them that got caught out and put the fire down. You know, a fire department. Pretty rinky-dink. Real basic stuff. More volunteers than actual firefighters. Couple of do-gooders out of help. You know the type of man. Your dad used to come out with us when he was a young un. Yeah, he told me about those days. Well, here's something he didn't tell you. Last summer, when we were putting that fire out, I saw something. I saw something odd, and I don't scare easily. Korea didn't break me in the fifties, and I'm pretty straight thinking, motherfucker. It takes a lot to rile me, but we were out there. Fire blazing in all directions, burning out of control, I tell you. Frank, it was like being in some kind of inferno or something. Putting down the fire best we could, quick as we could. Now I'm screaming, yelling, telling everyone what to do. Spray this way and that. And then I notice, right there in the flames, higher than hell, there's someone sitting there, just fucking sitting there, not moving an inch. His back turned to me. First, I thought it was one of them kids. Some hippie fucker still off his rocker on Potter, LSD, or whatever the kids had been doing when they started the fire. But it wasn't a kid. And I started hollering and screaming at this crazy bastard. Get out of there! Get out of there now! But the flames just kept growing and raging and getting closer to this poor fucker. Well, I started to run towards him. Maybe I can get him out of the fire. Uh, say... You want another drink, Frank? Eh, uh, no. I'm fine. Keep going. Okay, if you're sure. Anyway, I was running. Running like a bat out of hell. I ain't young, but I can still sprint when I need to. But I didn't need to. Because this man, if I can even call him that, hell, Roger, he was laughing. And I could tell from the way his shoulders were moving. He was sitting there in the flames, fucking laughing. Strangest thing I ever saw. The flame were licking at the stump he was sitting on. He must have felt the heat. It would have been fucking unbearable in what he was wearing, in the flames like he was. 
but the bastard just laughed. And I heard others calling me, asking me what the hell I was doing charging head on into the fire like that alone. I turned back around to look at the man on the tree, but he was gone. Just gone. Like he was never there. Like he was smoke or air. Well, he just sat there, looking straight ahead. A couple of locals had overheard our conversation and heads were turned as Frank raised his voice. But Frank said nothing. Tell you, Roger, he said, drinking the last of his beer. Those woods, something ain't right about them. That man on the stump, yeah, it was the strangest thing I ever saw. But it ain't the only thing I seen out there. Folks say there are lights in the trees at night, screaming like nothing you've ever heard. Coyotes scream like that. Make you think that they're human. Almost. I don't know, just something ain't right. I know, Frank. I said, almost at a loss for words. My daddy always told me to steer clear. I never knew why. But like he said, could have just been some stone little kid. I don't know a lot, Roger. Frank said, tipsy but lucid. But I can tell you one thing. Whatever's in those woods, it ain't kids. Now, looking back on the conversation, I guess it rang truer than I'd like to admit. I always thought my old man was crazy, but I guess he wasn't alone in thinking something was out there in them trees. And as long as I can remember, he always hated those fucking woods. And the journal ends here. I'll post more if I find anything. Nineteen eighty nine Between the Trees Part two Let's get straight into that. I couldn't find anything else from his notes, but my father remembers something about that town and those woods that you all might like to hear. I tried to type up the transcript of our conversation as best I could. Or he'd tell me about something that happened to him in the winter of nineteen eighty nine when he was back home from college for a vacation. Winter, 1989. Words of Michael Anderson, son of Roger Anderson. I was visiting home for the winter back in 89, home from my first semester at Washington State. My father, your grandfather, was 40 and I was 19. Well, he was younger than most fathers. He was only 21 when I was born, and so we got along well, even when I was a teen. Growing up in that town wasn't easy in the 1970s before cell phones and good TV. I had to wait until I was 16 and got my license before I could really do anything with my life. Obviously, we've been to Tacoma and Olympia and Seattle a few times. My father had a brother in Portland that we visited once or twice when I was young. But for all intents and purposes, my world ended at the town's limits. And Seattle was the biggest city I saw until I met your mother. Anyway... I was trying to make ends meet, so I was picking up some shifts at your grandfather's luck in business. It come a long way since 1969, let me tell you. And I got on well enough with all his workers. And for the most part, I'd grown up with them and had known them since I was little. Some old high school classmates, their older siblings as well. College, even Washington State, was a luxury by the town standards. And so, as funny as it sounds, they saw me as exotic. Almost cultured, even. I used to josh around a lot, tell me I was getting big for my boots. Mr. Big Shot going off to college to study literature. It seemed alien to them. But for the most part, when I was home, I was one of them, just like I'd always been. I asked my father whether he grew up hearing stories about the woods, and whether people still spoke about them often, and whether the mythos around them had grown. <laughs> Absolutely. Small town America in the Pacific Northwest, and so folk tales like those are almost a source of pride for folk like the people I grew up with. You weren't really considered a proper lug in town without some tall tales of your own. And sure, for most places, it was pretty basic. Bigfoot, UFOs, stuff on the TV. But for us, it was just the woods. Always the woods. Have you ever started talking about the forest? Everyone knew immediately exactly which one you meant. The things were pretty mild at first. I was just detoxing from my time at state, seeing old pals, old girlfriends, that type of thing. Up at first light, work hard through the day, 
finish off with a group of nightcap at the local bar. I was on the rage, but in our town that type of thing didn't really matter. Hell, the bartender knew everyone, and their grandmother, so as long as he could vouch for you, you knew you were okay. It bore you a drink. Besides, I was 19 by then, so I'd already had my fair share to drink. <laughs> Don't tell your mother I told you that. Well, there was this old boy among the loggers. Dick Baines was his name. He'd worked alongside my father when they were both young men. He was sort of a mentor to the rest of us, one of the old guard, as it were, there to watch over the younger recruits. By that time, my father had long since given up the manual side of the job and swapped to managing things. My parents were pretty comfortable by the time I was in my teens. Not bad, considering my father was raised by two alcoholics. And one night, Dick didn't make it to the bar with the rest of us after Friday shift. Nothing odd. A lot of them had families by then, especially at Dick's age. Wife, some young kids. We thought maybe he was taking his missus out for dinner or just taking it easy. And we drank as usual, and the night wore on, and Dick never showed. And then this young kid, two years younger than me, his name was David, the grocer's son, if I'm not mistaken. Well, he burst into the bar, white as a sheet. All the colour had drained right out of his face, like someone had pinpricked him and sucked the blood right out of his body. A freckly boy with bright red hair, very pale. We thought maybe he just had too much to drink and phoned up on the porch. We laughed at first, but then we realised that the boy wasn't drunk at all. He was as sober as a nun. Baines, he said, stuttering violently. I thought he was about to pass out right there on the floor in front of us. He, he hung himself. The whole bar went dead silent. No one moved, not a whisker. Then Harry, Dale's son, who was on the bar that night, spoke up. What the hell are you talking about, boy? Uh, David, he, he, he's in the w woods, j just hanging there. Now there was an unspoken rule around the town by then. Never take the woods, name in vain. I'm not joking. You told someone something happened in the woods, even if you told them you'd seen Jesus walking among the pines, they'd take your word for it and follow you out there to see it. And so, we all grabbed our coats and fired out of the place, following David to see if it really was Dick, up in some tree in the woods. And I felt sick already. I don't know if a man is ever old enough to see a dead body and not lose some part of himself in the process. And it was one hell of a cold night, too. Winter of 89. Yes, sir. One of the coldest on record. Roads frozen over, snow up to here. And my father held his hand up to his knee at that point. And we'd been working all day. We were still covered in wood pulp and soaked from the river. And so when we stepped out into the night air, we were exhausted frozen through, and a little drunk, all smelling a wet bark. And David, skinny little fella, led us down the road towards the forest. And we were all a little uneasy, making the journey. We'd all heard plenty of stories at this point, though most of us refused to believe that they were true. But we all hated walking into the woods. About fifty yards in, we saw him. Dick Baines, dead as a doornail hanging by the neck from a snowy branch, his feet about three feet off the ground. Ah, the moon was out, and in the light, Dick already looked like a ghost. Without exchanging a word, we all started the process of getting him down with some dignity. Two of us climbed the tree, and about three or four of us clustered beneath him, gripping his legs tightly to catch him when he fell. Dick, oh, he was one of us, so the cold was clear. We weren't going to let this body touch the dirt. It wouldn't have been right. I took out my hunting knife, one your grandfather gave me when I was fifteen and started cutting Dick down. The rope was wet with condensation. I could see the marks on Dick's skin where the rope had dug itself into his neck. He was facing away from me, which I was grateful for, because I don't think I would have managed to cut him down with him looking at me. And soon enough, the rope was cut, the men below him caught him, and they turned him over so that he faced the sky. A couple of them set about trying to get the noose off him, that's when we all saw it. He was... He was mutilated. Badly. His forehead had been cut meticulously. It looked like someone had taken a knife to him, 
His eyes were gone. In the nightlight, it just looked like his eyes were closed. Now, now we knew better. The symbol on his forehead was somehow the worst part. Worse even than his eyes being gone, strange as it sounds. Something about the shape of it scared the hell out of me. It wasn't just random cuts or scrapes, or there was geometry to it. A deep red circle and a bloody crosshair carved into its center. Now, they were all too focused on the body to see it, but I did. Way off in the woods, deep in the trees. A light. A bright light, not a lantern or a flashlight, but a bright orange glow, like a small sun in the moonlight. Well, there was no doubt about it. Some great bonfire blazing somewhere in a forest, deep in the woods, in a clearing. I couldn't wrap my head around it. No one camped out there. No one ever did. The cold dictated it. Nobody went into those woods if they could help it. On the same night we found Dick dead. Now, this was back in the 80s. I'm not proud to admit it, but out there in Shitsville, Washington, everyone was a diehard conservative. Republican to the bone. We were still blaming Led Zeppelin and Ozzy Osbourne for team violence, as you and everyone who listened to that shit started worshipping Satan and killing each other. I was 19. I didn't know better. I thought maybe some white trash metalheads had killed Dick as a dare, caught him up as a sick joke or something. And so, after we went to the police and got Dick's body out of the woods, I went home and got my father's gun, his old revolver that he kept around. I'm not proud of it, but I was scared and angry. I was still just a kid in so many ways, desperate to make everything right. I loaded a gun, hit it, and drove my car back out to where we found Dick. I was still under the influence. Some dumb kid who still believed in guns and Reagan and all that shit. I can't even believe we were even allowed to keep guns around the way we did. And so I parked my car at the edge of the forest near the road, close to the street line. I walked the rest of the way. I didn't want to leave my car out there in the forest. Just didn't seem wise. And so I walked down between the trees, past where we cut Dick down, and out towards the light. My father stopped for a while. It was difficult to get him to keep talking, but eventually he did. <sighs> if nothing else, ask her. Just remember this. Never try to be brave or bold in any of that stupid shit. Never risk your life or get an inflated sense of chivalry when you've been out drinking. No shame in asking for help. Never go alone. Well, if it wasn't for what happened that night, I think we'd have ended up living back there in that town. You, your mother, and me. It was shit like what happened to me that night that made me want to live out here in the city. Well, away from the countryside. America's old. Vast. The rules are different here. There's something about the place just makes things stranger. Things happen out here. In the older, wilder parts of America that don't happen anywhere else. I don't believe in God or the devil himself. But what I do believe in is that there are things out there in the woods and the mountains that we don't understand. I came to a clearing where I'd seen the bonfire. I had no idea what the hell I was looking at, and holding a gun didn't help either. I still felt myself trembling like a little boy, and I was staring up at, at this massive wooden thing, like a cross or a wicker man or something, just like in that old movie. The one where they burn the man inside. But it was worse than that. Smaller. Uneven. Odd. Unnatural. Contorted. I thought of the old history textbooks where I'd seen the Ku Klux Klan burning crosses and that's how I'd best describe it. Like everything evil had come together and coalesced in the clearing. I have no idea how in the fuck... Uh, I mean, how in the hell they did it. This great big crooked wooden cross built right here less than half a mile from town. And then I saw them. Jesus, I saw all of them. I hadn't even realized. There, there must have been a hundred of them, just standing there watching me from the trees. They just appeared, like they simply bled out of the darkness, simply came into being. They were so still, so quiet, so motionless. Even when someone's standing still, you can tell they're alive, tell they're human. They sway, they react, but they just, they just stood there, didn't flinch. 
Then I realized that one of them was closer, much closer than the others, behind the effigy watching me. I swear, I would have seen him, uh, her, uh, them. I have no idea. Just a face, almost featureless, but naturally even, preternaturally bright. Eyes that look like miles deep. I bolted. I ran and ran without looking back. And I heard it. Heard them right on my heels. I could hear branches and bark snapping behind me. The second set of footfalls, a hell of a lot faster than mine. Half a half beat behind me, gaining. I sprinted as fast as my drunk, dumb young brain would allow me. I saw the outline of the asphalt, the reflection of the street lamps off my car. And then I thought, fuck it. Stand and fight. And so, I turned around, drew my father's gun, and aimed it straight. But he wasn't right behind me. He was sixty yards off watching me, watching me from between the trees. And then he just slipped back into the darkness. Like he was never there. Like none of it ever happened. My father paused and looked out the window. A Boston brownstone looked out over the Charles. You could hear the sounds of the city outside. I think my father needed that. Needed it to remind him that there were people outside, and that he was thousands of miles from that town. Well, something about them wasn't right, Oscar. Not right. That night, that experience, had never left me. I don't think something like that does. Well, the cross wasn't there the next morning, or the morning after that. And then one day... I just stopped coming home from state, moved away, got a life, and didn't look back. A lot keeps me up at night, shit that I regret, shit that embarrasses me. But remembering that, remembering that night, the way Dick's body dangled lifelessly in the air, seeing that pair of eyes from behind the effigy for the first time. It doesn't just keep me up at night, that makes me look twice back over my shoulder and broad. Daylight. A lot else happened after 1989, but I'll leave that until the next post. Two thousand and nine, between the trees, part three. Let's get straight into that. Thanks to everyone for your patience. Well, it's quite difficult sifting through all of my family's documents and gathering the stories I can find. I needed to wait until my father and I were both back in Boston so we could piece some final details together. I have one last part to share with everyone. Hope this clears things up. This, well, this is about me now, primarily. I'm just writing things as I remember them looking back from 2022 to 2009. I was only eight when this next part happened, and for reasons you will soon probably understand, my father did his best to make me forget everything that I saw back then. And no more delay. 2009. Washington State. My grandfather Roger Anderson's death. It seems meaningless to point out how macabre a funeral can be. It useless as pointing out how wet water is. But this time, I was special. There were a lot of unanswered questions about my grandfather, from what I remember. The way he suddenly turned around his fortunes in the 70s, soon after having his son Michael, my father, becoming a shining example of what kind of self-made man a town was able to produce. Families always rising and falling in America. And what made my grandfather different? By 2009, most of the woods had disappeared. The town my father and grandfather knew was quickly evaporating. A lot of the old towns of the woods had started to become lost to time. Only a half were seen to remember them, and everyone who heard them passed them down via local oral tradition, or was either dead grown up, the latter category choosing not to pass the stories to their children, me and my generation, electing instead to keep talk of the woods out of the noughties. I was born in 2001 but nowhere near that town. My parents were working in LA at the time so I was born down there in Pasadena, though we didn't stay long enough for me to pick up an accent or surf culture of California. We swiftly moved to the east coast where I was only just shy of two years old. We barely ever visited my dad's family back in Washington. Barely spoke about them either. Not that we ever addressed this out loud. Nor had any animosity developed between my father and his parents. They just... drifted. 
I had only visited Washington State once before, when I was about six months old. I can't remember anything about it, obviously. But from what my parents told me, we never left the Seattle city limits after touching down. My dad's parents had to drive down to meet us for the weekend before we flew back to LAX. After we moved out east, my father made one or two trips back to see his folks. But he never went further than Tacoma. I never thought to ask why, but it struck me as odd. And growing up in Boston, I couldn't imagine ever not wanting to come back. But for my father, no distance between him and his hometown was big enough. And so, it wasn't until my grandfather died in 2009... At a relatively young age of 60, not that deaths at that age were particularly uncommon. He had been a manual labourer and grew up in a poor part of the States. His mother drank and smoked and did everything in between, and she was pregnant with him. Not to mention he himself was a habitual smoker, and never went easy on the alcohol during post-work trips to the bar with his lug of pals. I had never really developed any sort of relationship with him or his wife Mary, my grandmother. I'd been forced to speak to them over the phone a few times, the way parents often force their kids to say a polite, how do you do, to any relatives that come calling around Christmas time. I didn't even remember what his voice sounded like. And so we made the trip my father, Michael, had been dreading for years. The three of us, me, mother and father, packed a week's worth of luggage and headed to Boston Logan before boarding the excruciating flight to Washington. And we touched down, walking straight from the terminal to the rental car before making a long drive up north to my father's hometown. He made sure to sleep on the plane in anticipation of making the drive. He made the trip solo, effectively, as my mum and I dozed off instantly in the passenger seats. I reckon he hated that, making the drive without a soul to speak to, in the dark, and driving home between the trees. I woke up around 2am to the sound of the car door slamming. My father had gotten out and, as my eyes adjusted, I realised we were in the driveway of a large house. Flashy, modern, recently built. The driveway was trendy, made of gravel. The house was two storeys, mostly new, with exposed red brickwork. The living room was really quite something. A large circular room whose walls were almost entirely person-sized windows so that you could see clearly inside from the driveway. The black shapes of couches, lamps and coffee tables formed the silhouettes against the view of the back garden through the set of windows on the far side, and beyond those, just the trees. I saw my father embrace a woman who looked about sixty, but the dead giveaway was the fact that they looked so similar. I could see a clear reflection of my father in the creases of this old woman's face. She was my own flesh and blood, and yet I felt no connection to her. And she caught me staring at her, and my father waved me through the glass of the car window, smiling, smiling like a wolf at a rabbit. I was half walked, half carried into my late grandfather's house and up to a guest bedroom before being laid out in a temporary spring bed in the corner. I was only eight back then and the flight had completely taken me out as I slipped off pretty quickly after we got in. I had to get my father to fill in the gaps of what happened that night. Now this part according to my father, Michael, from a conversation in 2022. You remember the night we got there, right? Ah, of course. You and your mum were always lousy flats. So we went straight to bed. We laid you down asleep and you could barely keep your eyes open. Why hadn't you spoken to your parents for so long? Dad, reaching for his glass of water. Ah, things were a little weird for me after what happened back in 89, as I'm sure you can imagine. He took some time down in his water at this point, as if he was stolen so the town wasn't really the same for me. Try to steer clear. I was found an excuse to be staying with friends from college over the vacation periods, etc. And so nothing happened between you and Roger? Nothing specific. Oh, he was a very different man to who he'd been as a teen and a young man. Everyone said so. He wasn't very personable by the time I was 19 or 20, heading off to college. Well, did you ever have any... Inkling about what you find at this house in 2009? Jesus Christ, Oscar. Of course not. I had no fucking clue. He had... I know, Dad. I'm sorry. But did you and Mary talk about that night? Jesus. Everything. Anything. Nothing. She was my own mother and I hadn't seen her since 06 or 07. 
when I'd last flown out to Seattle to see them. I'd spoken to her on the phone only once or twice, and so we had a lot of catching up to do about my father and what things had been like for him in the last few months. I can't recall how exactly they said he died. I had had just about tracks. No one had a fucking clue. Two commoners and top-rate medical examiner couldn't even figure it out. He drank like a hog and smoked like he was an LBJ. But his liver was clean as a whistle, lungs like a man half his age. And that, that was the weirdest thing, actually. The fact that he seemed to be frozen in his 20s, at least on the inside. But they couldn't find anything wrong with him. Nothing with his heart, no stroke or hemorrhage or aneurysm or anything with his brain. It was like his soul just left one afternoon and left the perfectly healthy body behind. What did you tell people? At the funeral. Fucked if I could remember. I don't think anyone asked. Not because they didn't care, but I think everyone knew we, we wouldn't have an answer. And no, no one really knew how to deal with this type of shit. This type of shit always happened in that fucking town. And Dad took a second to collect himself. This is the rest of what he told me. Your grandmother and I started talking business after all the pleasantries were over with. What we'd do with the company now my father was dead. What we should do about employees we could no longer afford. What well, was the strangest thing? As soon as Roger died, everything just went to shit. Someone drowned on the job the day after Roger died. Just like that kid in 69. Then all the machinery started breaking down. Like someone flicked a switch and put everything on FUBAR setting. Fucked up beyond all recognition. And please... Don't tell your mother I'm talking like this. What I started to notice was that my mother didn't seem to give a shit about my dad dying. I mean, here we were, days after her husband died. They'd known each other their entire lives. Met when they were little. She was sitting there smiling, making us tea and talking about Roger dying as if it were exchanging baseball scores or some shit. The other thing was that everything in dad's house was just oh, fucking weird. He and mum were getting old, so I expected a little bit of hoarding and untidiness and shit. But I mean, there were these little wooden figures everywhere. Dream catches on the wall, all of that. They're like some of my friends' rooms back in the late 80s and 90s, when I was at college. Like I'd wandered into some stranger's house and she was wearing my mother's skin. That was one of the weirdest things that I ever experienced. And something about those figurines, well, the wood. My mind made a connection that my conscious self just wasn't ready to accept. Eventually, I tired mom out and she went to bed. It was 5 or 6 a.m. by this time, basically morning. But it was winter, so the outdoors were still pitch black other than the porch lights in the backyard and the driveway. I sat in the living room for a while, trying to take it all in. I love my father. goes without saying. But his death had somehow, I don't know, taking a weight off of my shoulders. Town seemed less scary somehow. Hey, you remember how I used to hate having to go back there? Never told you any of this as a kid, but you're old enough to know now that even adults shit themselves from time to time. I didn't think I'd ever have the chance to get sleep before Dad's funeral later that morning, so I set about trying to find whatever documents he'd left behind. That was when you woke up and found me downstairs, rummaging through his desk, you remember that, right? Yeah, I think I remember. Remember how fucking scared you looked? Don't use that type of language, Oscar. But yeah, I was freaked the fuck out. Had no idea what was going on. And then we found a locked strong box under his desk. You must remember the size of that fucking thing. I knew something was off about it. But I was still looking at those freaky little wooden toys and wooden crosses he had littered about the place. And we tried to open it, obviously. You stood there watching me wide-eyed as kids do when they're eight. And I couldn't find the key, so I thought to myself, fuck it, old man's dead. And so I just took a hammer and screwdriver to it and broke the lock open. And the rest was easy, at least in the sense of the damn thing finally being open. I don't mean that fucking mindfuck we got afterwards. I knew immediately what I was looking at. That's why I sent you back upstairs to your mother. Yeah, you wouldn't let me look inside. You told me to hurry back up to bed, and I thought you were angry at me. 
No, kiddo. You were a great kid. Didn't want you to see that... Uh, that fucked up shit. I mean, to have known Roger my whole life, only to fucking find the days after he died. Uh, they were hairs. Human fucking hairs. And teeth. And fucking fingernails. All packed up into little plastic Ziploc baggies like he was a fucking tooth fairy or some shit. Then, they were the photos. Some greater than others. Obviously taken in the 80s. And I immediately recognized that. That fucking cross from 89. Oh, I swear. That photo must have been taken the same fucking night that I found it. My father was there. He was fucking there with me in the clearing. Dad, Dad, it's, it's all right. I'm no kiddo. I'm sorry. This shit just so... Uh, anyway. There were other photos, more recent. Obviously from the 90s and the noughties. Right up until he died. People hanging, cut up, eyes gouged. Eyes gouged out. You don't want to know the rest. And the police who showed up that night. You remember that? Yeah. It scared the shit out of me. Of course it did. Anyway, they started searching the place. And that's why we had to get a hotel room. But whatever was happening in those woods at night, Roger had been a part of it. At least since 1970 or 71. Sometime around when I was born. When his fortune turned. Now they found a shit ton of spooky fucking weird shit there. Books the police couldn't even read. Because they weren't written in fucking English. Had to get a professor out from Washington State who could read fucking Persian or Sanskrit or some shit. They were... They were... They were fucking killing people. Gouging their eyes out. Because they... Because they... I should note that my dad was basically crying at this point. They thought he was making them rich. Making them lucky. I don't even fucking know. They were just killing people. Burning them and taking their fucking eyes out when they were still alive. Well, I think that night in 89, they were going to kill me. But my old man recognized me and stopped them before I had a chance. It was something like that. Let me go. Because he couldn't bring himself to... To fucking kill me. I'm so sorry, Dad. 2022 My father... A man in his early fifties is reduced to tears at the table. Outside, Boston is settling down into a humdrum at the weeknight dusk. And you can hear cars on the avenue, people below. I can hear boats on the chows from our brownstone. And somewhere, thousands of miles away, in the woods of Washington, they're still out there. And just like my father, I doubt I'll ever go back. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an intriguing and spine-tingling story there. For an incredible mind of Charlie Charlemagne from over on Reddit, No Sleep. A mighty thank you, Charlie, for allowing me to narrate your work on the show. What a wonderful step back in time, and you suddenly made the hair stand up on end on the back of my neck. I hope you enjoyed this rendition, and certainly look forward to more of your work in the future. Well... Guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Why well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Now if you'd like to get in touch with me, or maybe you're an aspiring writer, then please do so at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com I really look forward to hearing from you I hope you all had a fantastic week at work or school or perhaps you're a long distance driver whatever it is that you do I hope you're enjoying it and are giving it your all but above all guys remember be safe not sorry A lot else happened after that night. No.
One more two, one more three, one more pata 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 for me. And get this, on the far bank, uh, this guy, never seen him in my life, he's just watching us. <coughs> he looks at me like I was Jack's ghost. Well, which side of the... <coughs> which side of the... <coughs> What's his fucking voice? I have one last part to share with everyone. Someone drowned on a job the day after Roger died. 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 Roger